We'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Shannon Egan, and uh, welcome to Schmucker Art Gallery's uh, third uh, virtual gallery talk of the semester. Um, it's just so wonderful to, to see so many faces here uh, this evening. Um, I know we are all a little bit Zoom pros and also maybe a little bit Zoom fatigued. Um, but it's just, I'm just so grateful for everyone's willingness to, uh, to log on, um, to, to hear Emily Francisco, um, and to learn a little bit something new about art tonight. So, um, yeah, so just, so thank you. Thank you. Um, before I introduce you, uh, to Emily Francisco, I just want to mention a couple more upcoming virtual gallery talks in conjunction with our current exhibition in Schmucker Art Gallery titled, I Beseech You, Women, Art, Politics, and Power. Um, and so this Saturday, 3 p.m., uh, several of the student curators who worked with me um, on the exhibition will be talking about their research and their writing for the show, and that's this Saturday, 3 p.m. Um, also on Thursday, November 12th at 4 p.m., Professor Jerry Villagin, um, American Studies professor at Dickinson College, will be giving a presentation titled Disorderly Women, the Politics of Presence. And Zoom links for, um, for both of those events will be on the college's uh, events calendar. And also if you follow us on Facebook and Instagram, we have those posts there too. And for those of you who uh, are current on-campus Gettysburg College students, faculty or staff, the gallery is open Tuesday through Saturdays, uh, 10 to 4. Um, I also just want to take a minute to thank all of the um, sponsors of the co-sponsors of these of our exhibition and these programs, the Department of Africana Studies, the Art and Art History Department, Peace and Justice Studies, Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Environmental Studies, the Office of Multicultural Engagement, and the Women's Center and LGBTQIA Resource Center. Um, so thank you to all of those uh, offices for making the programs possible, as well as the generous donors and lenders to the exhibition, which include Dr. Deborah Smith, the Robin Wagner, Michael Berkner Acquisition Fund, the Lafayette College Art Galleries, Dickinson College's Trout Gallery and the Colby College Museum of Art, as well as artist Jessica Houston. Um, and now I am delighted to tell you a little bit about Emily. As I was preparing this introduction and reflecting on all of Emily's accomplishments and kind of wondering how she was able to do so much in such a short time, I realized that it has been um, 10 years since, or nearly 10 years since, since I've had the good fortune of knowing Emily. She was enrolled in um, one of my art history classes in 2011. And it was a class called Art and Public Policy. And that was the first time I ever taught the class. And it was also the first time I ever asked students to curate an exhibition as part of the course. And, um, and of course, Emily did an amazing job. And it was really the success of, of, you know, of her class and her enthusiasm um, that kind of encouraged me to become even more ambitious over the years with student curated exhibitions, which has resulted in the exhibition that we have up now. So it's been wonderful to watch Emily's endeavors, uh, curatorial endeavors ever since, not just during her time at Gettysburg, where she then also curated an exhibition of Andy Warhol's photographs, um, but also through her graduate, her graduate school program, her impressive internships at many different major museums, and now in her position at the National Gallery of Art. So after receiving her BA uh, from Gettysburg College in 2014, where she majored in art history as well as English with a writing concentration, she also minored in studio art. And then she earned a dual MA degrees in art history and museum studies from Syracuse University. Uh, currently, Emily is the curatorial assistant in the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art at the National Gallery of Art, where she works primarily on permanent collection projects and installations. And in addition to her daily responsibilities, Emily is part of a curatorial team that is developing um, an upcoming exhibition about women artists in the gallery's collection as part of a broader institutional initiative. 
And prior to Emily's current role, she was the collection management assistant in the gallery's Department of Photographs, where she cataloged over 1,000 photographs from the Corcoran collection. Emily has presented widely on her research and curatorial work, including a presentation just last week for the conference of the, of the University's Art Association of Canada, where she presented on living women artists and the National Gallery of Art. And also earlier this year, year, right before the pandemic, like late February, 2020, uh, I was able to see Emily at the College Art Association Conference in, in Chicago, where she was the moderator and panel co-chair for the session titled Women in the Nation's Collections. Emily has also presented her scholarship at the Feminist Art History Conference at American University and is also very active with the Emerging Arts Leadership DC. So I just wanna remind you that this presentation is, um, is being recorded and it will be made available on the college's YouTube channel. We'll have time for questions and answers um, at the very end of Emily's presentation. And if you prefer to not be on video, if you have a question but don't wanna be recorded, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box. You can write them throughout the talk. And then at the end of the talk, um, I will moderate the, the Q&A and, and read those questions and comments that pop up in the chat box. So now please join me in giving a virtual hand clap and a warm welcome to Emily and Francisco. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, my heart is so full. Um, really quickly, why don't I just share my screen and we will get going. Um, so thanks again, Shannon, um, and good evening, everybody. Um, again, my name is Emily Ann Francisco, and I'm the curatorial assistant in the Department of Modern Contemporary Art here at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, uh, just down the road from Gettysburg College, of course. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be speaking with you all tonight, uh, even if it has to be in this virtual space. Um, the Schmucker Art Gallery is really close to my heart. Um, as Shannon mentioned, um, I was in her first art and public policy class. Um, and I also was a gallery assistant with her for three years. Um, so I was really excited when Shannon told me uh, about the Ibisichu exhibition. And I was even more thrilled to hear about the, the student involvement. So of course, when she invited me to speak tonight, uh, of course I said yes. Um, it's really thanks to Shannon and the other incredible faculty in the art and art history department, as well as the English department um, that I was able to pursue a career in museums. So thank you so much. Um, it's really a great honor to be here tonight. So as many of us know, this year, uh, 2020, marked the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the American Constitution, which prohibited voter discrimination on the basis of sex and enabled many American women, though not all, the right to vote. And so timed with this important anniversary, many art museums across the country have been marking the event with bold acquisitions, initiatives, and exhibitions focused on women artists. Uh, so for example, um, the Baltimore Museum of Art, not too far from here, launched their 2020 vision initiative in which they committed to only purchasing works by women artists in 2020. And they also announced, I think roughly 16 exhibitions focusing on women artists with particular attention to women of color. And the Smithsonian, for instance, of course, was well ahead of the game. Uh, several years ago, they launched their Because of Her Story initiative, which is a women's history uh, focused initiative. Uh, the gallery is actually not under the Smithsonian. I should probably say that before I continue. Many people don't know that. Um, I didn't know that until I interned at the gallery uh, several years ago. Um, but we do have a collaborative relationship oftentimes. And across the country too, um, many museums, including my own, the National Gallery, also participated in the Forward Into Light campaign, uh, which I'm showing you here. Um, we lit up our West building in the colors purple and gold, uh, as in many museums and other cultural institutions across the country. Um, purple and gold are the colors of the suffragist, mu of the suffragist movement. And this campaign uh, occurred on August 26th in order to commemorate the day that the amendment was certified back in 1920. Uh, and August 26th is also notably Women's Equality Day as we celebrate it today. 
So in my job as curatorial assistant um, in my department, I work primarily on permanent collection projects, as Shannon mentioned. Um, and so that means projects that focus on objects that the gallery owns, cares for, and displays in our permanent galleries, uh, as opposed to special loan exhibitions. And I mostly work in our East Building, which I'm showing you here. Um, in the last shot, I showed you our West Building. So our campus is our West Building, East Building, and the Sculpture Garden, if you haven't visited us in the past. And over the past two years, I've been really fortunate to be a part of a curatorial team that's developing this series of interrelated installations focused on women and underrepresented artists at the gallery. And a key component uh, is going to be an upcoming exhibition that will examine the gallery's history of collecting and exhibiting works by women artists. Uh, the, pro the project is co-led by three curators. Uh, first, Nancy Anderson, who is our curator and head of American and British paintings. Also, Molly Donovan, our curator of contemporary art, who I work with very closely. And then Sarah Greeno, who is a senior curator and head of the Department of Photography. And like other museums, this project began out of a desire to participate in broader national conversations centering on the 19th Amendment centennial, uh, and also the intent and the, the strong desire really to install more works by women in our galleries. There are really countless hidden stories within our collection. And at first, on a basic level, our curators wanted to bring these stories outward and to the public, even if it was just through a single room installation that was timed with the suffrage centennial. And so what I'm showing you here is a great example of one of those hidden stories. This is a painting, an oil painting on wood panel by Beatrice Godwin Whistler. Um, you may not have heard of her. Um, this is our first painting by a woman artist that came into the gallery's collection. So we were actually only founded in 1941 and this work came into our collection in 1943. So it's a really early acquisition. And the story behind it is when it came into our collection, it was actually believed to be by her husband who you may be more familiar with and that's James McNeil Whistler. So here I'm showing you a back, uh, a back shot of the work um, when it came in, there was a label on the back um, that reads Mrs. J. McNeil Whistler, but as you can see on the right, the S in Mrs. is almost completely rubbed off. Um, so this here is a really interesting story of erasure within our own museum, um, and a great example of how, especially in our museum's early history, works by women artists came into our collection often almost purely by accident, not necessarily due to any particular intention on the part of curators. And now as the project and this idea about doing a show um, highlighting women artists at the gallery has evolved, it's really transformed into a major opportunity to examine the collection through a self-critical lens. It's also been an opportunity for collaborative research across many departments. Um, as well as a motivating force to get more works by women artists installed. Now, after we received some preliminary feedback a while back from peers from both within and outside our institution, it became clear that the, that the gallery's own collecting history could provide a critical framework for this project um, within which we could address the museum's significant collecting gaps and its um, frankly lukewarm history um, of, of not supporting women artists as much as, as well as it could throughout, um, throughout its history as an institution. And this is really a vast topic um, with a huge range of material and many avenues for research across the museum. And it's a lot to take on with many intersectional issues to consider. And thinking back to last year into the winter, um, Although the schedule hadn't yet been formalized and the timeline was tight, it was hoped that such an exhibition could still open at the museum, maybe later in the fall or even early winter 2020. Um, if we could, we wanted to be able to time it with the suffrage centennial. This of course was before March of this year happened. Um, so as you know, uh, the National Gallery and many museums all across the country uh, closed their doors roughly in mid-March to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And as the pandemic has continued on, countless exhibitions have had to be rescheduled and reconfigured within the gallery's future plans. 
and it was quickly realized that it would not be possible to launch our exhibition within this calendar year. There was just um, too much going on and um, we're also closed uh, for the most part. We've recently reopened part of our West building and sculpture garden, but it's gonna be a long time before uh, we fully reopen to visitors. In some ways, this delay has actually been somewhat of a blessing in disguise, um, as it'll allow our team a lot more time to make the show as strong as it can be and to pursue the more challenging questions that we hope that our show will pose for visitors. Over the past several years, but especially right now, uh, there's an ever increasing demand for museums like the National Gallery to become more self-critical and transparent especially as our audiences are eager for greater diversity in collecting, display, and programming. And I want to underscore that staff across the National Gallery of Art, not just in the curatorial division, have consciously joined what is in fact a decades-long, yet still urgent conversation surrounding the need to tell more balanced stories in art history and museums, especially in terms of the interwoven experiences of gender, race, and class. Backing up a little bit though, I want to next spend some time talking about the research that's come out of our efforts to organize an exhibition about women artists and the gallery. Um, Data-driven research and approaches to art history and museum work have come to the forefront of, of our institution in recent years. Um, and in our eventual exhibition about women artists and the gallery, data and data-based research will play a major role. So I'd like to take a moment to share some of this research, which was a collaborative effort really between uh, myself and my colleagues, Anjali Leibowitz in the photography department, as well as Catherine Southwick in American and British paintings. A little bit more about our history. Uh, since 1941, uh, the, which was the year that we opened to the public, the gallery has acquired over 150,000 works of art through gift, purchase, and transfer. Within that number, only about 12,000 of these works, so less than 8%, which you can see here in this blue wedge, only 8% are by women artists. Of course, because gender is intertwined with race and many other identities, we have to note a few other numbers here, which I've compiled for you in this table. I uh, bet you didn't think I was gonna show some graphs and charts as part of an art historical uh, gallery program. So showing you in this first line, um, we have about, well, 1,092 counted right now uh, works or 0.7% of the collection is created by 146 African-American artists, 25 of whom are, by, are women. The next line shows that only 550 works in our collection were made by 95 Latinx artists. So that's 0.35% for context. Of these, we have documented only 23 Latina artists. Although we've recently compiled data on Native American artists in the collection, partly uh, because the numbers are so small, it was pretty quick to pull together. We are still in the process of compiling some numbers on our Asian and Asian American LGBTQ plus artists and multiracial artists as well. Now, some might point to the countless historical and social factors that kept women and people of color outside many traditional arts establishments. Yet institutions like the National Gallery of Art must first hold ourselves accountable for reinforcing the norms that perpetuated the erasure of these artists. Though these statistics might seem to limit the types of narratives and histories the gallery can explore with its audiences, these numbers have also challenged us to ask difficult but exciting questions of our collections and ourselves. For example, um, throughout our ongoing research process for this future exhibition, uh, and it is very much ongoing, uh, we still don't know yet when this show will eventually be realized, we have found ourselves questioning common narratives in our own institution's history. So through my role in the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art, I personally have become very interested in the gallery's history of collecting works by living women artists. And by living women artists here, I'm referring to women who were alive at the time that their work was acquired by the National Gallery of Art. So this chart I'm showing you here um, was part of my research that I just presented last week, as Shannon mentioned. 
Um, this illustrates the works by women artists across the gallery's collection, uh, indicating the works by living women artists in blue. So you can see it's a very large number. Um, I found that the majority of works by women artists at the gallery period are by women who were alive when their work was acquired. Living women artists also account for about a fifth, so 20% of all living artists in the collection as a whole. In this area of collecting, um, so in thinking about con collecting contemporary art and works by living artists, I've also discovered that our institutional perceptions do not necessarily match our reality. So while our public narrative is that we did not collect living artists at all until 1962, uh, which was the year that we acquired the Chester Dale collection, which uh, was a significant collection of post-impressionist and other uh, modern uh, paintings um, and then modern art in general, a data-driven approach tells a quite different story. In fact, as you can see in this graph, um, which I created from collection data, it appears that the gallery gained thousands of works by living artists, many of whom were women as early as 1943. And this is discussed little in our institutional history. It turns out that 1943 was also the year with the largest acquisitions of works by women across the gallery in general. We've still never surpassed this seemingly watershed year for acquiring works by women artists. Put into context, the reason that the gallery acquired so many works by living women artists that year was due to two major gifts of prints and drawings. First, the Rosenwald collection and also the Index of American Design. And I'll explain a bit about what those were. So the Rosenwald collection um, was the collection of Lessing J. Rosenwald, who was one of the gallery's founding benefactors and our foremost donor of prints and drawings. He would give over 20,000 uh, works to the gallery over the course of his lifetime, and he died uh, in 1979. His collection spanned graphic arts from medieval times all the way up to the present, and this work here by Barbara Burridge is uh, one of many fine examples. He also gave some paintings and sculptures. So that painting I showed you earlier by uh, Beatrice Whistler was also from his collection. The Index of American Design actually has a really interesting story. And this uh, was actually a transfer from the Works Progress Administration. It was a Great Depression era federal art project initiative that was conceived to be a visual archive and resource for arts and crafts in the US. Um, and what it is, is it consists of over of a roughly 18,000 watercolor renderings of American decorative art objects. And time frame wise, these subjects ranged from colonial times all the way up to the 19th century. And this collection is also significant uh, when talking about women artists and gender, uh, because a third of these watercolors in this collection are by were created by women artists. So when we go back to the timeline I showed you before, when we crop out 1943 from the graph, we can actually see other patterns in the data. Later bumps uh, in acquisitions of works by living women artists also correspond with significant works on paper acquisitions. So when I say works on paper, I'm referring to prints and drawings uh, as well as photographs for the most part. So these later bumps uh, specifically reference later gifts from the Rosenwald collection, as well as the Reba and Dave Williams collection, which we got in 2008, and then the Corcoran collection later on around 2015. So essentially, uh, graphic arts acquisitions would continue to be the primary means through which the gallery acquired its largest clusters of works by women artists. This data says a great deal, especially when it comes to thinking about hierarchies of media within the gallery's own collection and how often our works by women artists are displayed, uh, which is sadly not that often, at least uh, historically. As you can see in this visual, the vast majority of works by women across the NGA's collection um, are on paper, including both living women and those who were deceased at the time of acquisition. So of the works by women at the National Gallery of Art, as you can see here, almost 48% are from that Index of American Design that I explained a moment ago, and that's here and marked in blue on this pie chart. 
And actually the Index of American Design has its own special medium classification in our database, um, which I find to be uh, kind of an interesting fact in itself. The second highest um, is prints at 31%, followed by photographs, uh, which you can see here in gray at 12.5%, and then drawings in yellow at 4%. So a number of factors and historical contexts might influence, uh, influence this. For example, several scholars have pointed out that drawing, printmaking, and even photography were more accessible media for women during certain time periods as they required less academic training and could be easily completed in domestic spaces through multiple interrupted sessions. Um, it, may make more, it may make sense then that there are more prints and photographs than paintings or sculptures by women at the NGA. Yet these works on paper can only be on view for three to four months at a time, and this is due to standard conservation concerns for light exposure. And something else, the, the National Gallery currently does not have permanent galleries devoted to works on paper, although we have uh, numerous rotating exhibitions. At a minimum, these works can be found on our website using the collection search feature, uh, but really this, this isn't quite enough. Um, when works are not displayed, they're often invisible to our publics. And I like to call this resulting effect uh, systemic invisibility, meaning works by women artists, especially women artists of color, many of whom are solely represented in our works on paper departments, are rarely put on view due to the fragilities of their material um, but also due to the higher prioritization of painting and sculpture at the gallery. So now that we know this and can acknowledge it, the next step is to work harder to get these works on view and seen by our publics. Now I know I've, I've talked a lot about um, the research side of things so far in my presentation um, and the, I, the ideas and the things that we're thinking about that will eventually in the future be incorporated into a large scale exhibition. But I also wanna talk about the aspects of our work that have been realized despite the pandemic and delays on reopening. So back when discussions began regarding the possibility of planning a series of installations focused on women artists in 2020, our contemporary curator immediately thought of one artist in our collection and that was Linda Benglis. In art history classrooms, her work is often taught in the context of feminist art. And here I'm showing you uh, just a couple of installation views of the resulting exhibition in our East Building. Um, the show was intended to open back in March and it was almost completely installed just as a museum shut down due to COVID-19. Uh, but luckily, I'm happy to share that the show will be extended and it will reopen as soon as the East Building reopens, which is likely uh, later next spring. Um, we're doing some ongoing renovations as well on that building. Um, so we're hopeful that later next year, um, you'll be able to see this show. We're also working on a digital tour component. Uh, so keep your eyes out for that. So why Benglis and why Linda Benglis and the National Gallery? Um, our museum has over 30 works by her. Uh, making us the largest public collection of Linda Benglis's work. Yet until now, only a few of these works have really ever been on view. And part of this again, um, I would say is the works on paper effect. Um, so almost half of these important works by her are prints, drawings, watercolors, and a photograph, most of which have been sitting in storage. For those less familiar with Linda Banglis, she is a pioneering contemporary artist. She's still alive today. Um, and she's worked in a huge range of materials throughout her career, including wax, resin, metal, latex, paper, glass, and video, uh, and so on. And from early in her career, she especially worked with materials that transform from liquid to solid uh, so, for example, the poured latex piece that's in the center of this room. Um, so in the lower right of the image, you can see that work. And Linda Benglis also often blends connotations of uh, high art and low art and culture, quote unquote. Um, and she tackles these notions of taste as well as notions of the decorative and what is considered to be 
quote unquote feminine. And you can see this uh, pretty well in Gento, which is the sculpture that I'm showing you here. Um, and this the title of this work, Gentaud, is actually French, and it's um, a title of a word for a French automobile, a specific type, actually. And the work was made using similar techniques to automobile production, hence the title. And so the way that the artist made this work is with a team, um, and they took a metallizing gun over a wire structure to create this decorative, pleated, almost floral shape. So here are just a couple of other quick installation shots. Um, here are a couple of those watercolors I was referencing a moment ago. And then uh, some of her uh, pleated metal pieces and knots. But besides the Linda Benglis show in the modern and contemporary department, we have also been intentionally installing more works by women artists in our East building galleries. Um, and before the closure, we were able to schedule several installs. We sort of had a running list and got to um, several of them. But we have more in the pipeline once we are able to, once things resume on a more normal schedule and we reopen. Some of these uh, new highlights include a work by Mimi Herbert, um, whose sculpture is in the center of this gallery. This is our uh, minimalism and post-minimalism galleries. And the, the red uh, piece in the center um, is made from folded acrylic sheet. Um, and Mimi Herbert is also a, a living artist and she's uh, not too far away. She's based here in DC. And the same space, we were also able to install um, a great work by Anne Truitt. Um, so you can see her work to the right. It's that cream colored uh, pillar sculpture. And Anne Truitt also has ties to DC. Um, and she's like an important uh, uh, sculptor in the history of minimalism as well. We also were able to get on view this amazing painting by Bridget Riley, um, who's a British artist. Um, Bridget Riley's work, this painting here, was actually, I believe, the first painting by a living woman artist to, to enter our collection, and that would have been in 1970. We also recently installed a work, um, I say recently, but of course this was several months ago, pre-March. <laughs> um, this painting by Sylvia Snowden on the right, um, so the abstract piece. Um, Sylvia Snowden also has ties to DC um, and she came in, her work came into our collection by way of the Corcoran and the Evans Tibbs collection of African-American art. And here we have on the left, um, one of our most recent acquisitions by Jean Quick to see Smith, um, installed next to one of our Andy Warhol pieces. And I wanna talk about um, this work by Smith a bit more in detail. Um, this is what we've been uh, at least advertising um, as the first painting by a Native American artist to come into our collection. Um, and this is 2020. Um, we do have two dozen works on paper, as I mentioned earlier in, in my data table, um, and those sadly have actually never been on view, going back to what I was saying earlier about um, works on paper and underrepresented artists. And this painting has a really interesting dialogue. Um, we, it, we installed it in our pop gallery, um, so she's adjacent to Andy Warhol and also across the room from Jasper Johns. Uh, and others. Um, and so there's a really interesting dialogue, um, intentional here uh, between her work um, and Warhol and Jasper Johns too. Uh, it's not in this shot, but the pieces I'm talking about for those of you who are art history majors, um, we have a few Jasper Johns target pieces up. Um, and this uh, work by Smith is called I See Red Target. Um, and it's made of two canvases, um, collage with um, clippings from mainstream newspapers and other objects. And then there is a notable target um, featured at the top of the work uh, with carefully arranged darts all along the top rim. And the work is intended to address both local and national conversations around the commercial branding of indigenous American identity. So um, we acquired this work in the winter um, and then announced it later on in the spring and uh, weirdly enough, timing is a funny thing. We announced it and then not long after 
um, the Washington football team announced their plans to change their team name. So sort of an interesting, interesting moment and, and very timely for sure. And if you're interested in learning more about this work, um, I highly recommend checking out this post on our pilot staff blog, which is on our website at nga.gov. Um, and this blog post is a really powerful reflection on the work written by my colleague in the publishing office, Sheena Condell. Another recent acquisition here, um, which we hope to install at some point uh, soon in the future once we can, um, this is a work by Maria Barrio, who is a Colombian born artist and she's based in New York City. And this is our first work by her to be added to the collection. And Barrio is known especially for her luminous collages made from Japanese papers, uh, which she paints with watercolor. And in terms of subject matter, her works depict women in spaces of refuge and imagined utopias that incorporate the cultural influences and flora of South America, where she's from. And the title of this piece is A Sunburst Restrained. Um, and and this, for this work, the artist's inspiration was actually a poem uh, by Pablo Neruda. Um, and the poem was titled Ode to a Lemon. And so in this poem, uh, Neruda links the greatness of celestial light to the modest but life-affirming form of a lemon. Hence the lemons in the painting sort of along the, the lower half. This work is really quite beautiful and meticulously crafted and in person it, it's very large scale as well. Um, it has an immersive presence. So I hope uh, by showing you these last two works, um, you've seen just a couple examples of some of our most recent acquisitions. Um, there are also two great examples of how my department is actively working to strategically fill in gaps in the gallery's collection. And we have many significant gaps, especially when it comes to women artists and artists of color as the data shows. We're working to remedy this um, and we're fortunate to have leadership that strongly supports and encourages these efforts. One might argue that the National Gallery's fraught history in terms of acquiring works by women artists simply mirrors broader longstanding issues about related to gender in the art world. Uh, but I would say that it is a useful case study, especially as we are an institution that call ourselves the nation's art museum. Something that I have not yet talked about today and which is important to close on is that in Washington DC, we actually often describe the National Gallery of Arts collection and that of other federal museums as the nation's collections. And this is because federal funds support the preservation and care of the works of art in our collection and there's a deeply felt responsibility in holding these objects in trust for our visitors who come from across the United States and also around the world. With this in mind, by virtue of the immense investments of time and resources into new acquisitions, our purchases and the gifts that we accept reflect our values. What we choose to collect is what we choose to care for, literally through conservation, storage, display, and security. Of course, this begs the question, whose stories are we preserving and protecting? What and who do we value? What we have collected in the past and what we continue to collect and what we show in our galleries all say something about how we perceive America and the place of art within our country. Yet how does a museum like the National Gallery of Art which endeavors to be for the nation and wishes to reflect the nation, move forward when its own collection is one of its greatest challenges. After all, exclusion is systemic and therefore the process of remedying past exclusions requires deep intentional reflection and actions in order to move forward. I like to think that perhaps the answer begins with simply asking the questions probing our own institutional histories, as well as the art historical canons, standards, and cultural narratives with which our museums remain so intensely entangled. Thank you very much for listening, and I'd be glad to take any questions or comments at this time. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I am, I'm going to um, start out by reading a couple of comments and questions that came in in the chat box. But for those of you who have additional questions, again, please, um, please raise your hands or use the raise your hand feature. Um, or again, type, type them in. So I'm going to start with um, a couple of questions about one of the, er the first paintings you showed of Mrs. Whistler. Yes. And, um, and if, how, how was it um, found out that it was Mrs. Whistler and not Mr. since the S was gone? Whose who's kind of careful work was, might that have been? Sure. Um, so I can't fully speak to that um, research story because it took place in um, the American Paintings Department, which is uh, separate, although we work together quite closely. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that, um, well, so also in that image, I don't know if you could tell, but the S um, was still there, but it was very faded. Mm -hmm. um, so my guess is someone noticed that and also um, the painting Peach Blossom, I think, was tied to um, Beatrice Whistler in some way. So she did have um, an artistic career, um, not as well known as, as her husband, but um, there are records um, and notations, presumably, of, um, of her work out there. So someone did a lot of digging. Um, maybe the, the label was the first thing that raised the question. Um, I, I actually, now I want to reach out to one of my uh, friends and colleagues in that department. So I, I do want to know what year that took place. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that when it came in, it was under uh, Mr. Whistler's name for, for a bit first before they realized it was uh, by Beatrice. Yeah. And then another comment, yeah, that um, God, Godwin Whistler still identified herself as the wife of James McNeil Whistler. So we're not too sure who wrote the Mrs. Mm -hmm. James McNeil Whistler. Um, but sometime later, yeah, um, we had imagined that that would not be so and, and gladly her contribution was discovered. So I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice to, um, and here's another question. How do you view the relationship between the low numbers of works by minority artists and the fact that there are now separate museums devoted to women in art, Native American culture, African American culture, et cetera. And does this affect your acquisition or I guess your, your strategy for acquisitions at all? That's a great question. Um, especially as it seems like DC is getting a new museum, you know, every couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, I think now there are discussions about, um, well, the Women's History Museum, I think, will be uh, on the horizon as well as, I think, a museum devoted to um, Latinx American history. Um, it's all, it's, they're all spaces um, for important stories that need to be told. Um, I would say, you know, we shouldn't just leave the collecting Native American art to the Museum of the American Indian. I think in a place like the National Gallery of Art, we want to be telling the stories of um, all Americans, especially Native American art is a huge part of that story. They're the original Americans. Um, and there's actually a really interesting um, show at um, American Indian right now um, called The Americans. Um, they have some really phenomenal material there. Um, that's just sort of one example, but um, we all collaborate and work together and it's really special to be in DC where all the museums are, you know, in a certain mile radius and we can reach out to colleagues, you know, across the mall for their advice and input. Um, and, and yeah, it's, again, it's, it, they're all important spaces, um, but just because one museum is devoted to um, African American history and culture does not mean that they're the only place that should be collecting art by, by Black artists. I, it should be happening everywhere. Good. I just want to read too that there's um, affirmation that yes, the National Women's History Museum is in the works post COVID. That'll be exciting to see. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> I know her as well. <laughs> yes, I worked there over the summer, so insider knowledge. Awesome, oh, thank you. Other questions? And again, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. Type something in the chat. Um, Emily, I do have a question that as a museum professional that I think quite a lot about, um, especially as like an educator is thinking about this idea of inclusionary storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned it in your, um, your lecture that um, 
you know, there's not enough being done. Um, and that's true, you know, with artists of color, women artists, et cetera. Um, and I'm wondering if you could touch upon your ideas of how you think besides just like putting the work on display um, and collecting more work, like how museums can work to become fully inclusionary and diverse institutions? Sure, uh, that's a great question. Um, beyond display and collecting, which are critical, um, I think staffing is also a big issue. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of criticism towards many large museums, well, museums in general, um, right now, uh, my institution included, for being primarily um, white institutions. Um, for example, at the gallery, um, you know, our curatorial staff is mostly white, maybe uh, one or two uh, staff of color, and they're not in the full curator roles. They're, they're in more entry-level positions. Um, that's, that's not unique. That's an issue uh, at many, many places, I believe. And um, museums need to really be thinking um, more about who, who we're working with and who um, we're inviting in. I think there are also systemic issues in general. Um, I could talk about um, you know, the ways in which things like unpaid internships uh, automatically affect who pursues careers in museums and, and what uh, you know, staff of large museums look like years down the road. Um, that's a whole other can of worms, but um, we have to think about the inside as well as what we're projecting outward to our visitors. Yeah, I completely agree, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, one, another question from a commenter. I love your observation on how works by women artists were not on display as often as works by men due to the work's material fragility. Could you expand on how this idea of systemic erasure and how the material hierarchy in the Western canon of art history, which paintings are you know, seen as more important than works on paper, can also affect the works and interpretations of people of color artists and or artists from other cultures? It's a great question. Mm, that's a great question. Mm. Yes, so the history of, it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot going on. Um, the material hierarchy, for sure, it's, it's very Eurocentric, which um, is very centered on painting and sculpture. Um, I know at, uh, at the National Gallery, um, we didn't have a photography uh, curatorial department, for example, until the 90s um, and our, our curator and head of that department right now who I referenced, Sarah Greeno, she um, was integral to the creation of that department. And the fact that it took until the 90s that to happen, we had many photo photographs before then, but they were in the care sort of lumped in with prints and drawings. Um, and uh, and yeah, things, things like, um, like that, um, you know, medium really matters um, and we don't always think about it, but um, oh gosh, there's so many ways to answer these questions and ideas. Um, and I know Tammy as well. So she's always thinking about materials and um, our conversations are always really fruitful. Um, with works on paper, um, something else I didn't really have the time to uh, mention in my talk, um, there's a lot of labor that goes into putting those on the wall. Um, so when you have a drawing or a, a print or a photograph, you know, it has to be matted and framed. And if you're putting it on the wall for a specific installation with a certain design aesthetic, all of that has to be considered. And so we have our own in-house matting and framers at the gallery because we're a very big place. Um, but, you know, they, there's a, a lot of work that has to be factored in before those things can even go physically on the wall. Whereas with a painting, um, they often stay, if, especially if they come to us with a certain frame, they stay in that frame um, for much of its life unless there's a particular issue or you know, research reveals that it should be shown a different way because um, we don't always know. And so there's less um, logistical work around that. Um, preparation of the object for, for display than there would be with works on paper. So um, there are a lot of interesting factors to consider with the, with the material side of these issues. Um, but I know Tammy also mentioned the Western canon 
Um, and I think I've been talking a lot in terms of, um, you know, Western art history. We do have to think beyond that too. Um, the gallery, we don't, we were founded primarily as uh, a museum that collected um, old master, quote unquote, works primarily European, some American, but even in our early history, there was this um, hierarchy of European artists at the top, American artists sort of somewhere at the bottom, like not as good, but you know, we still want to collect George Bellows and Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, and so we have some works by uh, Asian artists, um, but again, they're not on view that often. And um, it's, it's an area of collecting that hasn't been our focus, but you know, perhaps that will change. We do collect, uh, we collected a, or excuse me, we acquired a phenomenal painting by a contemporary Japanese painter um, last year, uh, Yoshitomo Nara. Um, so there are, um, there's some headway uh, being made, but it does take time. And we do, as, as the contemporary art world um, has become more and more global, I think it's important to think globally as well. So Tammy, I, I hope parts of that answered your questions. Um, if there are any follow-ups to that, happy to answer. Okay, I'll give that another, um, uh, yeah, any, oh, here's, here are a few more coming in. Um, um, how did you, this is um, Professor Rhett, how did you, um, it's great to see you. <laughs> Thank you for your <laughs> talk. Um, how did you decide on a graduate program and did you go straight from undergrad to Syracuse? And I think building on that, um, Professor Meyer asked, can you talk a little bit about your job and what you do on a daily basis? It all sounds so interesting. Sure. Hi, Professor Rett. <laughs> Hi, Nadine. <laughs> um, so I did go straight from undergrad to grad school, and that actually happened in an interesting way. So my senior year, um, I went abroad to Florence in the fall. I had wanted to go my junior year, but put it off because um, I was also working for um, residence life as a CA. Um, and so I, I went to Italy and was thinking about what would happen after uh, graduate school and, sorry, excuse me, after undergrad. I knew from talking to both faculty and the art department, as well as um, former supervisors from internships, that if I wanted to be in any form of research role at an art museum, I would need a master's degree. It was just kind of a matter of when I would decide to go. And at the time, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go straight in. I actually thought that I would take a year off, perhaps. Um, and so I was applying to jobs and also applied to um, just a couple of grad programs to keep the option open. Um, so I applied to just three places and um, Syracuse uh, has, a, has the incredible dual option for art history and museum studies. Um, I was really interested in going somewhere for a terminal master's where I could also build my uh, training in museums. Um, and when I was accepted at Syracuse, they also offered me a TA ship. Um, so uh, I said, yes, when you get offered a full funding package and support from an institution, you, it's good to go. Um, so I went, it actually was a really uh, great decision. I uh, found some other wonderful mentors there. Um, and, but how I came to work to think about museums and wanting to pursue work in museums, um, it started pretty early on at Gettysburg, I think. Um, I took a first year seminar that was taught by Felicia Else, who I think is here. <laughs> um, and it was on, it was called Florence, Art, Money and Power in a Renaissance City. I think she still taught it a couple of times. Um, and I, I became very interested in art history as a result. I knew when I decided to go to Gettysburg that I wanted to be somewhere, I wanted to go to a college where I could both write and paint. Um, and I figured I'd be an English major and then maybe double minor um, in studio art and art history if I ended up liking it. And then I got very sucked into art history after um, Felicia's seminar um, and then took Shannon's class my uh, sophomore year um, art and public policy, and uh, I, it was through that class really that I started to um, to think about the ways in which my interests in the arts, um, as well as um, politics and government, and and also uh, writing. Um, so something I learned 
um, from Shannon, as well as through um, some internships that I was able to complete while in undergrad, that um, museum world um, really blends these sort of two different, these two worlds that I had um, sort of straddled um, at Gettysburg, which was, you know, the literary and the, and the textual and then the visual. Um, so um, I, I entered actually a Muslim in library uh, first. That was my first museum, <laughs> museum uh, position. Technically, I was, I was their exhibits intern. Um, and I worked on their uh, Civil War, uh, I think it was the 150th anniversary that was coming up around then. So I worked with their exhibits committee on a number of projects. Uh, and that happened um, partly because um, uh, I think Robin Wagner had come to uh, a panel talk that myself and a few other classmates were giving with Shannon's um, Art and Public Policy class. So it all kind of built from there. Um, but I think it's, it's been a really uh, interesting um, field to be in, and I feel very lucky to have had the mentors that I've had and, and the support network, um, as well as the training. Um, you know, you, you, I, I write and um, do research as part of my daily responsibilities. Um, when, I was, when I was in the photographs department, I, actually, I was cataloging, uh, which is basically um, a combination of research, data entry, and um, copy editing in a weird way. Not, not everybody uses that, that term for it, but I realized that um, my editing experience that I got through um, my, my writing background um, was extremely useful because essentially we have to make sure as catalogers that everything in our database about a particular uh, object in our collection is as accurate and complete as possible uh, free of errors, um, so that when it, you know, feeds to our public website, that the information that um, people, um, visitors to our website are looking for, um, can easily find it and understand it. So, um, yeah, it's sort of been an interesting, interesting journey. I had at one point thought about um, art publishing, um, and that was my first uh, role at the National Gallery was um, in a summer internship as a grad student in their publishing office, working with the editor in chief. Um, and that was really eye opening. It kind of showed me that there are many layers to the museum world that you don't always think about. Um, and all of there are actually a ton of art history and English majors that I've met at, at the museum. And that's been kind of funny. Um, a number of people that I work very closely with when it comes up, I'm like, oh, wow, another art history and English double major. That's incredible. Um, so I, I think we have one, time for just one question that popped up in the chat, which is, um, oh, another question. Oh, here it is. Uh, if, if there's a museum in the US that has successfully incorporated female artists into their collection and acts as a model for other museums, mm -hmm. and if you can speak to that model. Sure. That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, two places come to mind. Um, one, which I don't know if it's necessarily a model um, for every institution, but it's a place that's important. And that's the National Museum of Women in the Arts, which is also in DC. Um, and I believe they were founded um, specifically out of a great need um, to showcase more works by women artists, um, especially in DC. Um, I don't know their exact founding year, um, but uh, their mission has always been to support women identifying artists um, and to showcase their work and celebrate, um, celebrate uh, women artists. Their role is sort of really changed and adapted to the times. They're very socially engaged and um, I think they have a number of interesting resources on their website related to advocacy. And I, I, I find that really, um, really fascinating and admirable. Um, again, the model wouldn't necessarily work everywhere. Uh, you know, at a, at a federal museum, we can't necessarily um, do that same level of advocacy work, at least, um, you know, under the guise of the National Gallery. But it's great to, to see and support the work that they're doing. Um, the Baltimore Museum of Art, which I referenced at the beginning of my talk, um, they've, they've gotten a lot of headlines and they've been proposing some really interesting and different approaches. Um, and I'm curious to sort of follow that more in the future um, to see how their projects unfold. So 
Um, and I think they are actually, um, one of their more controversial announcements was that they're going to be um, deaccessioning. Uh, so what that means is ethically, um, you know, removing certain works from their collection, um, possibly selling them and, well, deaccessioning is, is much broader than that, but in this case, they're, they're selling um, specific works from their collection um, and then using the funds to um, acquire more, more works by underrepresented artists in their collection. Um, I find that to be really interesting and um, curious to see how that model works for them in the future. It's something, the, the gallery, we, we don't deaccession. That's actually in our, um, I don't know if it's in our like, written policies, but it's certain, and certainly in our, um, at least like verbal and formal policies, we don't, uh, everything that enters our collection is, is, is permanent and, for, and it will be um, in our care in perpetuity. Um, but, but what Baltimore is doing is really uh, different and uh, we'll see how it unfolds. Well, I don't want to keep anyone too long, but Emily, if maybe if you have a couple of minutes, you can, um, we can follow up sure. with one more question at the end. Um, but I just want to say for those of you who have to leave, thank you so much uh, for being here. I'm going to stop the recording right now, but I really appreciate everyone coming around. Again, I'll be here. I think Emily will be here for a few more minutes and we can, we can address uh, Erica's question and just maybe chat and catch up. So thank you all. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Thank you all.